There was a man that used to lecture on child rearing. He had been a professor for a long time and lectured throughout his single years to parents and how to be parents. His lectures evolved, though, over the years. When he was single and he started off lecturing on parenting, he taught the Ten Commandments for Parenting. After his first child, he changed the title to Ten Hints for Parenting. After the second child, it became the Ten Suggestions for Parenting. When he had his third, he quit lecturing. <laughs> Being a parent can be really challenging. The only way to really learn this is by becoming one. Chuck Smith used to say this, when I had no children, I understood the issues of parenting perfectly. Then we had our first child and I realized that there were things I didn't know. As my kids began to grow, I realized there were quite a few things I didn't know. By the time my children became teenagers, I was realizing that I really didn't know a whole lot about raising kids at all. By the time I had grandkids, I realized absolutely nothing about raising kids. You know, maturity brings a level of humility and wisdom, and that is so true when you're a parent. It's easy to become a parent, but it takes wisdom to be a good one. And that's why we're looking into the scriptures today, to find God's wisdom in the midst of a great calling to be parents. And it's ironic in our society that you need a license to get married or drive a car, <laughs> all these different things to go fishing, but not to be a parent. And I'm not suggesting we should, but kids don't come with an instruction manual. Today, in God's Word, He has commands for parents. Our creator and designer gives us instruction on our family life. He created it so he knows the ins and outs of it. He who called you is able to enable you to be a good parent. You just got to look to him and rely upon him. Scripture will give us the instruction we need and the Holy Spirit will give us the help as he is called the helper or paraclete in the Greek, one who comes alongside, you know. He'll be right alongside you through the whole process. In Colossians, we've been studying about our new life in Christ and how that brings us into a new community called the church. And then we've been doing our series now on new relationships. This new life in Christ impacts all of our relationships. The gospel brings revolutionary teaching to all these relationships, and especially the family. We talked last week about that historical context of family life in the Roman world, where there was something called patria potestas, the power of a father that was absolute over his children, his grandchildren, and other descendants, even adopted children. He could kick the kids out of the house. He could sell them as slaves or even kill them legally. He had the power of life and death. And that started at birth. When a child was born, the child would be laid at the father's feet. And if the father picked up the child as his own, then they were accepted. If the father turned his back on the child, then that child would be taken to the town square and be picked up by anyone to be raised as a slave or a prostitute. So you can see that Paul's instruction in that context is revolutionary. That parents actually had an obligation to their children and vice versa, as we talked about last week. The gospel brings this revolutionary teaching for parents and especially in our culture today. It might not be the extreme on the other end, but it can be the extreme um, on the opposite side of things with 
the amount of neglect that we might see in parenting today. But follow in the footsteps of the instruction we find in Scripture, because in Ephesians chapter 5, there is a parallel passage that begins by saying in Ephesians 5, 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then it goes on to say, wives to your husbands, and then husbands, love your wives, and then children, obey your parents, and then parents, don't provoke your children. So you see this mutual submission when you come to know Christ, that we walk in the footsteps of Jesus, of humility and service to one another out of love. This was revolutionary, and it still is today, that there would be a mutual submission in our homes. And here, on the parent's side, their obligation is to be mindful of their kids' needs, their feelings, and desires. So check this out in verse 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Paul puts the delegated responsibility, the weight of that responsibility on the father, but we also apply this to mothers. Parents, in general, is how I would apply it, but it doesn't take away of the responsibility of the father. And especially in that he not provoke his children. This word to provoke in the Greek means this, to cause someone to react with irritation or bitterness. It's not just telling bad dad jokes and you get the eye roll. This is something deeper. In response to harsh treatment or neglect, to cause resentment due to ongoing dysfunction. That provoking of children leads to a rebellious heart. It leads to a hurt, broken relationship. In a survey of hundreds of children, three things fathers say most in responding to their kids. I'm too tired. We don't have enough money. And keep quiet. Interesting. That is discouraging for kids. We have so many more things we can say to our kids that can lift them up. The command is not to provoke because they might become discouraged, which literally this word means to be without heart, to lose heart or spirit, figuratively to become disheartened to the extent of losing all motivation. Now, that kind of comes with the territory with adolescence, but at the same time, don't let you be the motivation for their lack of motivation, right? Discouragement is something the enemy knows is one of his greatest tools in our lives. As parents, you know, even as we start this message, I probably don't have to um, manipulate any form of guilt for you because just being a parent, you feel a sense of weight and responsibility and perhaps even guilt, even if you're doing a good job. But if we cause our kids to become discouraged, it means that they feel not loved, not worthy, and they can't do anything right. Nothing impacts a child's self-image like the words of their mother or father. You have a tremendous power in their lives. Parents impart an identity and confidence and motivation in, the, in their relationship. Kids are already discouraged in this world after being on social media, after going to their schools, after riding the bus and coming home. I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot more to add to the discouragement in the lives of our kids. So understand that as a parent, it's our job to protect them from that. 
Now, we can't protect them from everything, of course, but we can sure do the opposite of discouragement, and that is to give heart to the discouraged. I like to think of it like a football game. You're in halftime. The teams come to the uh, locker room, and they're losing, and they're bummed out. And you don't have to tell them to be bummed out. They just are. And the coach has an opportunity to turn this thing around. And oftentimes, it's the team that plays with heart that's going to win. And so what is it his job to do? It's to give heart to his team. It's to encourage them and pump them up and, and get them ready to play with everything that they have so that when they run back onto that field for the second half, they can be victorious. You know, and even if they do lose, they're going to be encouraged as a team. You know, and that's the way it is in life. Maybe at your house, it's like halftime and things have gotten kind of quiet and faces are downturned and people have lost heart. And moms and dads, it's time to come in. And be the coach for your kids and encourage them. Well, remember that this verse doesn't just apply to fathers. It also applies to mothers. There's a similar thought or an idea that's taught in Proverbs 14, verse 1. It says, the wisest of women builds her house, builds up her kids, encourages them, and, and builds them up in the faith. But folly with her own hands tears it down. You know, watch your heart towards your kids. If you're disappointed or frustrated or you find yourself becoming um, critical, be careful. You have the opportunity to build your house up. Now, the causes of resentment are many. The causes of discouragement that flow from a parent come from a lot of different things. Some of those examples are these, the authoritarian parent, where it's all rules and no relationship. One thing you can be sure of, and this I learned as a youth pastor, is that rules without relationship equals rebellion. <laughs> you can guarantee it. And some of you parents grew up in homes that were like that. Do what I say, don't ask why, you know, um, without a relationship. Sometimes that discouragement comes from distance, being home but unavailable. And you know what I mean by that is that you can be there physically but not there in terms of relationship or heart. Be in touch with where your kids are at, you know? Stop by and squeeze their shoulder or give them a hug, you know? Maybe it's being demanding. In our fear of not wanting our children to fail in life, but rather to be successful, we can become unreasonable, making expectations that our kids have a hard time meeting, which doesn't mean you shouldn't have expectations, by the way. <laughs> but a demanding parent can be rough to live with. Or perhaps as a parent, we can provoke our kids by saying, do what I say, but don't do what I do. By setting a bad example, Integrity in your life strengthens the hearts of your kids. Kids need to have a hero in their dad. You know, and one day when they get a little older, they learn that you're not all that, right? But when they're little kids, they think you are Superman. <laughs> and then one day when they have kids of their own, they, they kind of come back to that, whoa, my dad knew what was going on. But be a good example. We can dishearten our kids by being selfish, by treating them as an inconvenience or an irritation, or maybe being abusive. There is literal abuse physically, but there's also verbal 
Be careful of that passive-aggressive way of trying to motivate your kids, you know? Insulting or teasing or whatever it may be. Um, they need to feel loved instead. Well, you're your child's number one coach. What kind of coach will you be? But even better picture than a coach is our heavenly father. You know, one who is always there, always attentive, and he knows what's going on and he cares. If your kids are not playing with heart, it's your opportunity to encourage them. Well, Billy Graham, the evangelist, speaking in Madison Square Garden some years ago, offered parents six suggestions on how to curb delinquency among teenagers. You know, if you really want to see society change, it starts in your own home. And he said this, number one, take time with your children. Number two, set your children a good example. Three, give your children ideals for living. Four, have a lot of activities planned because uh, another thing I used, learned as a youth pastor, you know, kids will find something to do. <laughs> Wouldn't you rather be doing things with them? Five, discipline your children. Six, teach them about God. You know, some good practical wisdom from Billy Graham. But maybe you've blown it and your relationship with your kid is broken. There's distance, there's resentment. You can do everything you can, as far as it depends on you, to reinitiate a relationship, to build a bridge of peace and love to your kid. There's a Spanish story of a father and a son who became estranged. The son ran away and the father sent off to find him. He searched for months to no avail. Finally, in a last desperate effort to find him, the father put an ad in the Madrid newspaper. And the ad read this, Dear Paco, meet me in front of this new newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. That Saturday, 800 Pacos showed up in front of that newspaper office looking for forgiveness from their father. You don't realize the opportunity you have as parents, and it may not be that easy, <laughs> but understand that truly is the heart of our children. They want love and forgiveness and encouragement. So instead of letting that happen, you have the opportunity when things are good to really make them awesome. Spend time with them. I've always encouraged parents that quality time is quantity time. There is no substitution. And we kind of tell ourselves, well, we'll make it quality time, but you can't make up for that importance of time. And so, you know, if you're getting hung up by things and not giving time to your kids, realize quality time is quantity time. And yeah, they need their space, especially when they get older. I mean, don't smother them. But at the same time, are you there? Are you available? You know, I think it's important to do stuff together, to make memories together and so we like to go to the ocean. That's our happy place to get away, to just be a family and enjoy God's creation and chill um, and do stuff together. So a couple years ago, I was really excited because I bought a skimboard and I was going to teach my kids how to skimboard because I used to be really good at it. And uh, so I took them out there and I felt really cool walking with my sons holding the skimboard, you know, in our swimming trunks and getting ready to show them how it's done. And it's been a long time since I had skimboard. 
and I'd become a little more top heavy than I remembered. So when I ran full speed and threw that thing on the ground to jump onto it, it was a beautiful thing. You know, the wind going through my hair, the mist touching my skin and flying into the air and landing on that board. And then it went boom <laughs> on the wet sand. I lost my breath. Uh, I'm writhing on the ground in pain. And when I finally got my breath and stood up, I was like, all right, guys, who wants to try it? <laughs> They're like, no, thanks. <laughs> Nobody tried it. But have you ever felt like that as a parent? You know, you're, you're trying and you do something and then you just go, bam, just bite it, you know? I think your kids like to watch you try more than they do to watch you avoid. So you might not feel successful all the time, but I guarantee you when you're together, they'll forgive all that. When you're encouraging your kids, treat them of equal worth. Just like when we talked about husbands and wives being equal in the Lord and with regards to being heirs of salvation. So it is with parents and children. They are of equal value. They're not lesser beings. They're equal heirs in the kingdom of God. And so respect does go both ways. You know, if you want it, you got to give it. And so finding an appropriate way to do that takes wisdom. But the old way of generations before, you respect me because of who I am, you know, that just doesn't fly. Respect goes both ways. Take time to treat them like a <laughs> full-fledged person, you know, as they get older and trust them with some things, you know, bring them into the garage with you. Let them swing a hammer with you or drill some drills or uh, drill some holes and some screws with you, you know. Now, the parallel passage in Ephesians, in Ephesians 6, 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children, sounds familiar, to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So this parallel passage is interesting. Colossians tells us what not to do and what the consequences would be. But here in Ephesians, it tells us what to do. So it's not just an absence of activity, but there's actually something to do. And so we find the importance of nourishment, training, and instruction. Three things. Nourishment. The word bring them up in Ephesians chapter 5, or chapter 6, verse 4, sorry. The word bring them up means to nourish, to raise a child to maturity by providing for physical and psychological needs. Ultimately, it points to the entire education of a child in preparation for adulthood. Nourishment is not just a motherly trait, men. It's something God has called us to do as well. Even God is given the picture of being nourishing. Children should be treated with tenderness, not molded, but unfolded, if you will. Not pressed into a form, but discovering who God has made your child. Discovering their gifted, gifting and, and what they're interested in and fan it into flame. You know, instead of trying to make them into something that you want them to be, like a little mini-me of you, they're already a little mini-me of you, whether you realize it or not. But you might find the things that they love and that they're interested in are totally different than which you love and what you're interested in. But you can take the opportunity to nourish that because those differences, 
Those interests and those giftings will be the thing that makes them up of who they are when they become an adult, you know? If you're there cheering them on and fanning that into flame, how cool to be able to bring them up, to nourish them. And then also we're told to discipline. Discipline means to train someone with regards to mind and morals for responsible living. It's often accomplished in the context of correction and discipline. We're told that God, our Heavenly Father, disciplines us, and it's a sign of His love. Check this out in Hebrews 12, verse 5. It says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves and chastises every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. You see, a father will treat an illegitimate child without discipline because he doesn't care. But a caring father, there is nourishment, but there also is discipline. God's the best example for you in that. Children are looking for boundaries. I've experienced it a lot. Again, as a youth pastor, as partnering with parents. Sometimes I've had kids in the youth group, unchurched kids, that... Their schools would call them bad kids, you know, kids that had been kicked out of school or kids that have H-A-D-D or whatever it is, and adults just write them off as being like uncontrollable. <laughs> but when I was a youth pastor, what I learned oftentimes in the lives of these kids, not all of them, but some of them that were in this place, that they lacked consistent rules in their household. They lacked somebody that cared enough to tell them no. They cared enough to come into their life and carry out some form of discipline. You know, we oftentimes don't think of that. That the kids that don't get any of that at home are feeling unloved and illegitimate. Ultimately, caring enough to discipline communicates love. Sometimes it hurts as a parent to discipline because it is more fun to be the good guy, right? But there are times when we feel like the bad guy. But if you're disciplining in a way that is how our Heavenly Father would discipline, you are the good guy. I'd rather discipline and have my child develop a bad character and then have to struggle with that for the rest of their lives. And so Proverbs warns us of this, of being a, a standoffish parent that allows everything and doesn't discipline. Proverbs 13, 24 says, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Though the rod may be used as a spanking tool, understand this was a picture of a caring shepherd with his rod, not a slave driver with a whip, but a shepherd with a rod. Proverbs twenty two fifteen, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Remember when you were young and the silly things you used to do because you just didn't know any better. I've had plenty of those. I can look back on dropping flaming bags of dog stuff on people's doorsteps, ringing the doorbell and running away. You know, back in the day when it was cool to do uh, prank calls, can't do that anymore, but uh, hey, is Mr. Fridge there? Or no, it's, uh, sorry, I just, 
I just blew the joke. It's been a long time. Hey, is your fridge running? And they're like, yeah. Well, you better go catch it. You know, we thought we were so funny as kids. But, and then you get caught. And then you're in big trouble. Caller ID ruined it all, you know. <laughs> Proverbs 23, verse 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol or from hell. You know, discipline is important. Discipline them now and save them from much pain and suffering later in life. But here's some things I've learned about discipline. You know, having four kids, um, there was one instance when my youngest, after he had done something that I deemed worthy of a spanking, took him into his room and spanked him on the bottom. And he turned around and he looked at me. And he said, how come you get to hit me and I don't get to hit anybody? <laughs> I was like, ooh, well, you want to know? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But in that moment, I was like, oh, man, you know, hit me in the heart. You know, we didn't beat our kids or anything like that, but discipline needs to be, number one, controlled. Never discipline out of anger. If you do, you'll always regret it. If you're leaving marks, that's too much. It needs to be controlled, consistent, and appropriate. You know, the last time I disciplined my, my girl, <laughs> all I did was I just tapped her ever so slightly. You know, I was like, you're going to get a spanking. And she's standing there, no. And I just tap her, boop, and she collapses <laughs> on the floor. And I was like, okay, I think we're done with this. <laughs> but then one of my kids, we would spank him, and he loved pain. He didn't care. And he would even, you could see him thinking in his mind, I think it's worth it. You know, I'll, <laughs> I'll do this thing that I'm not supposed to do because I can deal with the pain, you know. But... What he couldn't deal with was being put in his room. Oh, because he was a man of action. You don't take away his action um, without him feeling horrible. So we eventually learned that discipline also is customized. <laughs> customized for each child. They don't receive the same discipline because they're not all the same kind of learners. They don't all respond the same. If you try to put one form of discipline that works with one kid on another, you'll probably find yourself um, not being as effective as you could. Some need a lot less than the others. Don't crush the gentle ones the way you do the men of action. <laughs> And sometimes the men of action, instead of crushing them, it's just having them sit on their bed, <laughs> you know, and that crushes their heart. So as parents, we're always learning and we're always figuring those things out. What's going to work the best? How, what's really going to communicate the message? It's not about taking out your anger or inflicting pain just for the, the pain of it, you know. There should always be a purpose, and that is to bring them correction. So discipline needs to be controlled, customized, and I think it's good, too, that it's communicated. Say what the consequences will be whenever, is po whenever possible before something happens, you know? If you do that one more time, <laughs> you know, you're going to not be able to play your video game for a while, you know. 
Because then they'll learn that you're consistent, you're not out of control. Um, communicating also sometimes means admitting when you got it wrong. If you fly off the handle and if you discipline out of anger, sometimes it means sitting on the side of the bed with them and saying, you know what? I'm sorry. You know, I went too far. Please forgive me. And that goes a long way with kids. Sometimes maybe you find out it wasn't that kid. You ever have that situation? <laughs> Oops, disciplined the wrong one. You little stinker. You know, the other kid that got away with it. And you have to say, you know what, I'm sorry. But don't ignore it. Don't act like, you know, you're untouchable. But lastly, discipline should be prayerful. We need a lot of wisdom when we're disciplining to make it effective and to make sure we're not going overboard, to make sure that we're doing it in a way that is pleasing the Lord. Therefore, we, we need God's direction because there's not necessarily a specific verse to deal with that situation. So we need God's direction. We pray. So it's better sometimes to say, you know what, go to your room and I'll be there in a little bit. <laughs> and then take time to cool off, take time to pray and figure out what you're going to do. We're also prayerful because we need God's supernatural power. Because in our own strength, we mess it up. Well, the last thing in this verse, in Ephesians chapter 6, is instruction, it says. So bring them up or nourish them, discipline them, and also instruct them. Which literally means to place in the mind. The distinctive feature of instruction is training by word of mouth, any word of encouragement, reproof, counsel, which leads to correct behavior and belief. Children, you know, they, they do need to hear your wisdom and life lessons, but there's one thing they need to hear above all, and that is what the scriptures say. Take the opportunities to bring God's word into the situation. We teach them, instruct them in the ways of the Lord, it says. Parents got, are God's primary means to pass his word on to the next generation. It's not the responsibility of the Sunday school teacher or the youth pastor to be the primary source, although sometimes it is that way, it should be that the parents are able to take that role. And you might not know a ton, but there's one thing I can guarantee. You can always come with at least one little nugget. One nugget to share. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, we see God's instruction for parents in passing on the faith to their children. And sometimes I think we approach this with such a heaviness because we're so overwhelmed by the thought of like trying to have a family devotion that is um, structured like a Bible study, teaching like a, the pastor. Um, and you think, oh, I can't teach like that. So this gives us some great direction a commission as parents to pass on the word, but it also, I think, gives you a sense of relief on how it's done. It says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your hearts. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. How many of those words included sitting down in a classroom style setting? Zero. <laughs> Notice what it says as you're walking along, as you're driving in the car, 
in our day and age. Or maybe go on a walk. As you're putting them to bed, there's one time in the, in the day when kids just want to keep talking. And that's bedtime. <laughs> and you'll find one day you'll miss that, you know, when you don't have it. Um, but when it's there, take advantage of it. Oh, read me just one more story. Oh, let's just talk a little longer, you know. So while you're out walking, while you're out camping, while you're out fishing, while you're doing the chores, while you're sitting down to the dinner table, there's another great time. And I would encourage you, if you're not having dinner together at a table once in a while, that you should probably reestablish that somehow, if at all possible, at least sometimes during the week. Parents need to spend time in the Word to have nuggets to teach the kids, you know? And so, are you reading the Word yourself? Are you listening in your discipleship group? Are you um, maybe catching something on the radio or a podcast or at church on Sunday? You know, maybe for you, it's just once a week, write down a nugget that the Lord has given you. And by nugget, I'm like talking about gold nugget, <laughs> you know? not a chicken nugget, but <laughs> you mine out this gold nugget. You just find it there and it's just so priceless and amazing. Take time to really think about it and pray about it. And then in a teachable moment to bring it out, unfold it, and let, let the Lord teach. If you're just doing that once a week in whatever kind of situation God opens to you as a parent, you know, you're doing pretty dang good. It's life on life instruction. You know, don't, don't make your faith all about being in a building or um, you, you got to break down the walls and bring your faith into different situations and everywhere in your lives. Get involved. Even ask them, hey, what'd you learn in kids' church? You know, what's that little project about? Um, what verse did you learn about? And sometimes they forget, and uh, you got to remind them. And I think our curriculum now has like little memory verse cards and crafts and all sorts of things. So parents, you can take that as an opportunity. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Remember this great principle as a parent. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Pray for God's grace that you might walk with your kids through this life as a loving parent that is their number one coach, that is their great role model, the one that God has entrusted to pass the word on to the next generation. Well, I want to end with this. There were two families from the state of New York that were studied very carefully from back in history. One was the Max Juke family, and the other was the Jonathan Edwards family. Some of you guys remember Jonathan Edwards. Both of these men were chosen for their diverse beliefs, but also because they both fathered 13 kids. So it wasn't too hard to uh, set them apart from others. 13 kids. Here are the legacies each of them left behind. The things that were discovered through this study were totally remarkable. Max Jukes was an unbelieving man and he'd married a woman of like character who lacked principle. Max Jukes was an atheist and believed that the abolition of laws and rules were good. Mr. Jukes formed an organization called the Freedom Movement that preached free sex, no laws, no formal education, and no responsibilities. And among the known descendants, over 1,200 were studied. And here's what happened to them. 310 became professional vagrants. 440 were physically wrecked by a debauched lifestyle. 130 were sent to the pen or jail for 
for an average of 13 years each, seven of them for murder. There were over 100 that became alcoholics, 60 became thieves, 190 public prostitutes. Of the 20 who learned the trade, 10 of them learned the trade in prison. It cost the state more than $1.5 million, much more if translated in today's dollars, to take care of these 1,200 descendants. In the same era, the family of Jonathan Edwards came on the scene. Jonathan Edwards was known as the disciplinarian, not because he disciplined his children harshly, but because he believed in self-discipline. He became a preacher that believed leading by example was important. And Jonathan Edwards, a man of God, married a woman of like character, and their family began as they became part of the study that was made. 300 became clergymen, missionaries, theological professors. Over 100 became college professors. 100 became attorneys. Maybe that's not so good. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You always got a joke with attorneys, right? 30 of them judges. Six of them became physicians. Or 60, I'm sorry. 60 of them became physicians. 60 became authors of classics. 14 became presidents of universities. There were a number of them that were giants in American industry. Three of them became U.S. congressmen and... One became vice president of the United States. The legacy of the two men. Interesting, it started in a household with 13 kids. <laughs> totally different way of parenting. So I want to encourage you today to think of your legacy. First of all, for children, value your godly heritage Never despise it. The world will want you to reject it and join their misery. And they'll say, you're only like that because your parents raised you that way. But you know what? You can turn that back around on them. <laughs> and you are only like that because your parents raised you that way. Which way is better? Children, don't despise your godly heritage, but understand that your parents are imperfect, but their love for you is, is perfect. And that will never change. Recognize that they're loving you when they're trying to show you love and they're failing. You can chuckle to yourself and say, you know what? I, I know you love me. <laughs> thanks for trying to show me how to skimboard, but no thanks. <laughs> Value your godly heritage. But parents, strive to leave a godly legacy. God's given you a great opportunity, power and responsibility. And understand, every parent struggles with guilt. I can remember when we were young parents and we were worrying, are we ruining our kids? Have you ever had that conversation? Are we ruining our kids late at night when you're sitting there thinking about things? Even when they don't do anything wrong, parents worry. Why? Well, we worry about what we care about. Parents strive to leave a godly legacy. and Don't let the worries discourage you. And don't let failure discourage you because everybody in this room is sitting in the same boat. We've all failed at some point. And it's never too late. God can restore the years that the locusts have eaten. You know, that's a great principle in Scripture. So what actions will you take this week? How will you honor Jesus as a child in your home? Or parents, how will you honor Jesus as a parent? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. 
Even as we look through Scripture, we know you use some pretty messed up families in powerful ways. Your grace was able to transform and, and bring the gospel even. And Lord, we just turn to you in our own weaknesses, in our own failures, whether we be children or parents, Lord, and we surrender to you. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your understanding and your patience and your willingness to pick us back up, dust us off, and be like that coach even in our lives and go get them. Lord, if there's anybody here this morning that needs to return to you, realizing that you are their heavenly father and they have run from you, that they might pray this prayer in their heart. Heavenly father, thank you for sending your only son to die for my sin on the cross. I receive your gift for me to pay for my sin, to give me eternal life. I put my faith in you. And I call on your name, Jesus Christ, Son of God, save me, sinner. Thank you for bringing me now into your family, making me your child, being the perfect father. Help me to follow you, to love you and serve you all my days. We pray in Jesus' name.